Welcome back to Honor Flight South Alabama, a special hour. There were many women who played important roles during the war. Whether they were nurses or wax or waves, they held down many, many different jobs and were a huge part of the effort. Today, the wax are serving with the armed forces in every major theater of war. And it wasn't just military service. Women mobilized to meet every challenge, gaining new skills and new opportunities. All day long, with rain or shine, she's a part of the assembly line. She's making history, working for victory. Rosie, the For many, meeting the challenge led to life-changing experiences. Mary Hirschfeld was something new for the Navy during World War II. Women, with so many men needed to fight the war, a lot of jobs were left undone. That's where separate organizations like the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps, or WACS, or the Navy's Women Accepted for Voluntary Emergency Service, or WAVES, helped. They wanted people to take over the jobs that men were doing so they could, bless them, <laughs> go uh, and serve. Hirschfeld was one of some 80,000 waves at the height of the war. With a degree in home economics, she was exactly the kind of person the Navy looked for. They sent her to boot camp in New York and a station at Navy Barracks in Daytona Beach. She was also a member of the Shore Patrol, the Navy's police force. It was quite a great experience because you met girls from all over. It wasn't the first time the Navy enlisted women to help. Decades earlier, in World War I, enlisted women were called yeomen, filling mostly secretarial and clerical jobs. But during the Second World War, their jobs were expanded to include aviation and intelligence, among others. Hirschfeld's tour lasted until they learned the war in Europe had ended. We celebrated. Oh, that bad. was a real celebration because we knew then that it wasn't going to be that long. What brand? Waves. The waves. Waves. Go Navy, beat Army. Go Navy, go Navy beat Army. <laughs> Mary Bouch shared with us the day she told her parents she'd join the Navy. And I showed them the papers, and immediately my mother had tears in her eyes. And she came over and hugged me. And I said, this is about the waves. She said, I don't want you to go, but I'd go if I were you. And off she went to boot camp at Hunter College in the Bronx, New York, Yeoman School in Oklahoma, then to her assignment in the heart of war decision making, Washington, D.C. We had very little knowledge of what the enemy planes looked like. Her post was at the Technical Air Intelligence Office. Their job was to solve a very serious problem. Our people were getting shot down too fast. So the Navy took action. They mounted cameras on their own combat planes. As aerial battles commenced, pictures were being taken. Send those pictures back to us. We'd sort them out to see which plane it was. We had names for them. I knew the, the Bettys and the Zeeks and all of those. Balch was the latest woman veteran to travel aboard Honor Flight South Alabama. A fellow veteran urged her to apply. He was so thrilled with what happened that day. He said, Mary, have you sent in your application yet? And I had by that time. And he said, it's a day you'll never forget. Mary Bouch's job was just one important way women answered the call to war. Helen Pearson would end up holding another important position. She was absolutely sure she would be making a contribution during the war. I wanted to go in the service. I wanted to be an MP. They said no. At the time, she didn't know how her service to her country would affect her the rest of her life. She ended up at a headquarters unit for a message center at Buckingham Army Airfield in Florida. She helped send and receive classified and unclassified messages for the Army. It's where the Army also trained gunners to serve on B-17 bombers. They were in the most dangerous thing. Being in that, that bubble on that B-17 and the uh, pilot and the navigators, they would come down there and outfit the B-17 and take the gunners with them. And when they went by, our prayers were with them because we knew their life would be very short. But that wasn't all Pearson would find at the base where she served. She would also find her future husband. My husband was acting sergeant major of the field. 
Helen and Rudy Pearson were married the day after the D-Day invasion and continued serving together. Rudy Pearson passed away in 2001, but it was actually his memory that prompted Helen to go on Honor Flight 4. Her daughter was arranged for him to be there too. Joe Barnum was there, and uh, I said, what's going on? And Laura said, nothing, Mother, he just wants you there. The next thing I know, Joe Barnum was presenting me with a flag for my husband. Now, if you don't think that was a shock. He's with him, he's spiritually. Honor Flight proved to be quite a memorable experience for two other women veterans. Not only do they live on the Gulf Coast, they shared the same job while serving during World War II and had never met each other before the flight. Aileen Woods and Jane Blanchford were already nurses when they signed up for the Army toward the end of the war. And of course, the, all the non-columns did not like it because we were given a commission the minute we, we signed up. But Uncle Sam said he needed 65,000 nurses, and I figured I could be one of those. After basic training, she served at a North Carolina hospital that specialized in pulmonary diseases, and there was plenty of that from soldiers who served in the Pacific, especially tuberculosis. And we, they were so consumed with tuberculosis that we did not look to see how much TB they had. We looked to see how much lung they had left to work with. For Blatchford, a senior nurse at Fort Benjamin Harrison in Indiana, she treated the wounded returning from one of the bloodiest battles of the war, D-Day. Three days after D-Day, we had our first patients. Can you imagine? Today, it would be nothing, but back then, three days from Europe with wounded patients. And both women were involved in what back then must have been a true medical miracle, the first experimental use of penicillin. It replaced maggots as a standard treatment for infected wounds. While both had lived on the Gulf Coast for many years, they didn't know each other until recently, the day they flew on Honor Flight South Alabama. Then getting together with all these veterans on this flight was absolutely one of the most wonderful experiences I ever had. And given that they worked so closely between life and death, it was no surprise the most memorable part of the trip was laying a wreath on the Tomb of the Unknowns at Arlington National Cemetery. Well, I still have to swallow hard. Mm -hmm. Probably the greatest honor I've ever had in my life. Stay with us. When we come back, you'll find out how Honor Flight South Alabama came to happen in the first place and meet some of the people who make it happen. They're called guardians. These guys and gals get a hold of your heartstrings.